Well, good morning, everybody. If you could locate the book of 2 Samuel. This rapture series is taking you into books all over the place, which is a good thing, amen? 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 19, we're in um, part of the tail end, believe it or not, of this rapture series on questions and answers. So a number of people have submitted questions, and I tried to pick the questions that most people are asking. And so today we have in Sunday School three questions to look at concerning the doctrine of the rapture. And this first one is a big one. Everybody wants to know about this. And it has to do with infants and the rapture. So here is the question. It says, what about parents who have infant children when the rapture happens? Um, Will their children leave with them who haven't had a chance to make an informed decision to accept Christ? Is there any scripture that sheds light on this? And this is one of those questions that I've kept kicking the can down the road. And I've, I've never really wanted to get into this. And one of the reasons I haven't wanted to get into, into it is I don't really know if I have a definitive answer. And the reason I don't have a definitive answer is because I have uh, just a few strands of Bible to work with. And most of the strands that I'm working with um, don't really connect the issue to the rapture. So I'm I'm forced to kind of deal with this by way of inference. So really what people are wanting to know is what about when the rapture happens? What about the child in the womb of their mother that has never had an opportunity to hear the gospel, let alone understand the gospel, what's going to happen to them? Um, And this is the kind of question that gets into what we call the age of accountability. People say, well, what is that age of accountability? And don't ask me, I have no idea. Um, Because the Bible doesn't give an age of accountability. But what people mean by age of accountability is what about those who are too young to believe you know they're they either haven't been born yet or they have been born and they can't understand language and what about people with dis, some kind of disability which prevents them from you know hearing and understanding um, what is going to happen to them at the point of the rapture and and has God made provision for them there really isn't a lot of information in the Bible on this except this, this one set of verses. It's in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, and I'm going to pick it up there at verse 19. But you probably know the story. It's the story of David and his adultery with Bathsheba. And there was a child that was born through that unholy union. And the child dies. And when the child dies, David is comforted. And he comforts his uh, his wife, then, then who became his wife, Bathsheba, the mother, because of the death of this child. And he makes a statement here that many have used to argue that God has made provision for either the preborn the unborn or those that are too young to have the ability to receive the gospel and those who have some kind of mental disability preventing them from hearing and and understanding the gospel. So without this passage, I wouldn't have anything to talk about, but there is something here. And notice, if you will, 2 Samuel 12. Look, if you will, at verse 19. It says, but when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that they, that the child, that's the child born from this adulterous union, that the child was dead. 
And so David said to his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Verse 20, so David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. So, in other words, he broke his fast. And then verse 21, it says, Then his servants said to him, What is this thing you have done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. Verse 22, he said, while the child was still alive, this is David talking now, I fasted and wept for I said, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back? And then here's the key line. He says, I will go to him, that's the child, but he will not return to me. So here David makes a statement that why should I fast anymore? The child is dead, and when I die, I will go to him. Now, I understand that as the child went into the presence of the Lord, and David, when he died, would see that child again one day. And so this becomes, you know, a tremendous um, comfort to parents um, where the wife has had a miscarriage or maybe there's someone who's been put under pressure to have an abortion or, you know, the death of, death of a very young child. You know, you wonder, um, gosh, they, they never really understood the gospel. They never heard the gospel. What's going to happen to their soul? Well, this is my interpretation of it. Um, essentially, they will see that child again because that child was under the age of accountability. So they didn't have an ability to understand the gospel and believe it, and so God's grace is so big that it makes provision for that child. Now, when you deal with Calvinists, and I've dealt with a lot of them, what they say is, no, you're reading too much into the passage. And really what this is talking about is just the common grave. You know, the child went into the common grave and David went into the common grave. And then you ask them, well, is David going to see the child again? And what they'll say is, well, David will see the child again if the child is one of the elect. Now, try preaching that to a grieving parent at a funeral. See, and this, this is this, the type of thing that goes on in academia where people are kind of in their ivory tower and they've worked out their theology, they think, and yet it has absolutely no practical or edificational value outside the church. In fact, it, it, if you tell somebody that, it will probably emotionally destroy, you know, if not debilitate them. And I was talking to a five-point Calvinist, fairly well-known guy. And I posed this question to him. I said, would you use that, what you just told me? You'll see the child again if they're one of the elect. Well, what if they're not one of the elect? Then they went to hell. I mean, are you going to use that at a memorial service? And honest to God, this is what this five-point Calvinist told me. He says, well, in that case, I usually just lie. That's what he said. So you're, you're, you're telling someone one thing at a funeral that's inconsistent with your beliefs in theology. That, that is not how you do theology. If your theology is going to work, it can't just work in a book. Uh, it can't just work in an academic institution. It's got to work in real life. That's why I believe some of the best theologians out there are pastors, In fact, on our faculty at Chafer Theological Seminary, every single person that works for us as a teacher is also a pastor. You know, they're not somebody that's sitting in a room somewhere, running computer programs, parsing verbs, um, insulated from reality. 
And I learned from some very, very good people as I was going through seminary. Dr. Pentecost, uh, Dr. Leitner, uh, Dr. Toussaint, Dr. Constable, and every single person I learned from was also or had been a pastor of a church. And so there, so when I was listening to their theology, it wasn't just some academic statement. It was something that was working in the real world. And one of the problems with Christian academia is we've, we've turned to the academy and created a bunch of experts in different things. And they are experts in their little field. But they're not living in the real world, to be honest with you. And that's why they come up with some of these crazy ideas. And the idea that you tell somebody that they're going to see their child again only if the child is one of the elect, it doesn't fit with verse 24, which I haven't read yet. Then David, what? Comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went into her and slept with her, and she gave birth to a son. She named him Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. Verse 24 follows verse 23. Amen? Amen. And it says in verse 24, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. Put yourself in Bathsheba's shoes. Hey, uh, sweetheart, uh, we're going to see the child again if the child is one of the elect. Well, gee, Mr. Husband, what if the child is not one of the elect? Then the child is going to go to hell because that's God's pre-programmed purpose for the child. Um, and be comforted by that. Would, would any sane person be comforted by that prospect? So I do not believe in this interpretation that this is just speaking of the common grave. I think what it's talking about is the provision that God made for that child who was beneath the age of accountability. So I believe this passage teaches that God's grace is so big that if you have the inability to hear, understand, believe then you're covered by the grace of God. That's, that's what I believe. That's what I teach. That's what I think the Bible says. And that's the only reasonable comfort to give to somebody, you know, in this circumstance. So the big question is, okay, if there is such a thing as the age of accountability, and it may be different from person to person, um, then how does this relate to the rapture? And again, I can't be dogmatic here because there's some other passages that may speak to the issue that aren't really in the rapture context. But most of the people in our camp that I've read on this, whether it's the uh, late John Walvoord, uh, whether it's my professor, Robert Leitner, are of the persuasion that if the rapture were to occur today, and somebody had a child that didn't have the ability to believe, either because of age or disability or being within the womb of the mother, then they too would be taken in the rapture. And they get this from 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, which says, For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her husband. For otherwise, your children are unclean, but they are holy. So what he is saying there is, in a situation calling for a potential divorce, because a couple is unequally yoked, and obviously you shouldn't marry a unbeliever on the front end, right? Amen? But what do you do in a situation where you're married to somebody and one of the parties in the marriage hears about Jesus and gets saved, the other one remains in unbelief? I mean, what if you've got a believing wife and an unbelieving husband? Should the unbelieving, excuse me, should the believing wife cut and run? I mean, is that grounds for separation? Now, when you go down this road, um, we're in this society now of all of these abusive type of situations. And I don't think Paul is dealing here with the issue of physical abuse, emotional abuse. 
I think he, he's not carving out every single possibility that we think of in the 21st century. I think he's just giving a standard rule. Two people are unsaved. They're in a marriage. The wife believes. The husband doesn't. What should the believing wife do? Does she have grounds to leave the marriage? Paul says no. Because her presence in the marriage is a sanctifying influence on her unbelieving husband and also her own children. So it's from a passage like that that people conclude that if the rapture were to occur today and a believer, a believing family had children under the age of accountability, that not only would the believing believers in the family be taken, but so would all of the other <clears throat> children under the age of accountability. Um, again, you have to reason this way, not from a direct rapture passage, but you have to go into 1 Corinthians 7 to get this interpretation. My favorite book which I'll recommend to you if you're struggling with this issue, because this is a big issue for a lot of people. It's a big struggle. What about those who can't believe? Um, I recommend this book here by my professor, Robert Leitner, who's now with the Lord. So I think it's very biblically sound, and the title of it is Safe in the Arms of Jesus. God's provision for the death of, of those who cannot believe. So he is specifically dealing in this book with the issue of God's provision of grace for those under the age of accountability, either because of youth, still in the womb of their mother, or some sort of disability. And Robert Leitner on page three talks about what he thinks will happen at the point of the rapture when the mom is a believer and yet she's pregnant. What happens to that child? Robert Leitner says this, the pregnant women who are saved will be caught up or raptured when Jesus comes for his own. It is reasonable to believe that their unborn children will share in the physical transformation that takes place at the Lord's coming. So, you know, if a woman is pregnant and she's a believer and the rapture occurs, according to Robert Leitner, it's not a situation where she is raptured to heaven and the unborn child, you know, who is beneath the age of accountability is left behind. He says they all go together. And I would concur with what he's saying. Not because he has a direct passage in the Bible where we can point to it and say, thus saith the Lord. He's just reasoning from inference. We're all, we're all concerned about all of these contingencies. If God carved out every single contingency that we wrestle with in the 21st century, do you realize how big this book would be? I mean, it would be so big no one would read it, first of all it would look like the United States tax code. <laughs> and God has decided to give us a finite revelation, 66 books. So when people come to the Bible and they want these specific answers, the truth of the matter is God hasn't disclosed everything that we would like to know. He has disclosed everything that we need to know, that's the doctrine of sufficiency. But he has not necessarily disclosed everything that we would like to know. And at some point, you have to rest on the character of God. Yeah, Lord, you didn't answer my question specifically, but I know at the end of the day, your character is love. God is love. And you have made provision for those who cannot believe. Well, what if the child is born. What if you've got a believing mom, a believing dad, you have a child that's not unborn, but a child that's born, but that child, because of disability or youth, is beneath the age of accountability, and they have the inability to believe. What happens to that child at the point of the rapture? Robert Leitner says, 
they're all, the child is taken in the rapture. So notice what he says here. I think it's on page 73 of this book. He says, what about those who cannot believe? Who are living when the, rapture, when the Lord returns? And those who are saved parents. Will the parents be taken to be with the Lord and the child left on the earth? He says, I think not. Exclamation point. That's what I really liked about Leitner, by the way. He was one of these guys, when he taught, he's with the Lord now, but he was very clear to give what he thought was the correct view on something, which is not how education is done today. It's not how seminary is done today. It's not how theological education is done today. It's not even how I was taught. What they did is they laid out all the alternatives and they let the student decide what they thought was the best one. That's why everybody is into these Zondervan Four Views books. Four Views on the Millennium. I didn't know there were four views, but there is a four views or maybe three views on the millennium. Four views on the rapture. Four views on eternal security. And when the board asked me to become president of Chafer Theological Seminary, what I said is, that mindset stops right now. Because Chafer Theological Seminary has a doctrinal statement. And we are not in the business of just throwing out all the views and letting students pick what they want. We're going to give them what we think is the correct view. Well, gee, you're really being narrow because that's not what education is about. You should expose the students to all the views. I agree. Expose the students to all the views, but tell them what we believe is the right view. And that's how Robert Leitner, who was old school, that's how he taught. He would say, it's this, here's this view, here's this view, here's this view. And then he would say, now for the right view. <laughs> and we sort of chuckled in class when he did that because that's not postmodern to say stuff like that. You know, all views are equal, modern education. Everybody is entitled to their own thoughts. No, they're not. Some thoughts are right, some thoughts are wrong. Read your Bible and you'll see Jesus talking. I don't think Jesus would ever have been given tenure in any academic institution today. <laughs> Except maybe Chafer and we don't, we don't give tenure. Why don't we give tenure? Because when people go liberal, you can get rid of them. You, re you realize that, right? Um, I remember Paige Patterson, there was a, a huge thing that Paige Patterson, Adrian Rogers, and a judge, and his name escapes me, but they did something at one of the big Southern Baptist seminaries that's never been done. There were a bunch of people over there at that time that were denying inerrancy, and they went and they started firing people. And they actually turned a school that was moving in a liberal direction and they put it back on the right path. I think his name was Judge Pressler, if I remember. It was like a triumvirate of the three of them. In the 1980s, they did this. And you have to understand that that has never, never happened, as far as I know, in church history. Once an institution moves off the rails, it's almost impossible to get it on the right path, but these three got this big Southern Baptist school on the right path, at least for a season. And I remember Paige Patterson, who would come to our pre-trip study group. I just came back from that group this week. Um, I remember when Paige Patterson was involved, he would walk into the group and he would literally be smiling from ear to ear. And so someone would say, well, Paige, you know, what are you so happy about? I mean, you must have had a great year at the school that you're the president of. And he would say, you know, in this kind of Baptist-y, Southern drawl, he goes, it's been an absolutely fantastic year. We've had 65 resignations. <laughs> and so 
That, that was Robert Leitner. That's who Robert Leitner re reminds me of. He says, I think not, because those who are living at the Lord's return are incapable of believing. And they will be caught up to be with the Lord in just the same way as those who have trusted Jesus as their personal Savior. I do not believe that God will divide families by taking the parents to be with him and leaving behind their children who cannot believe to endure his wrath in the tribulation. Why is he reasoning this way? He thinks it contradicts God's character and it contradicts this verse here. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, where the presence of the believer in the marriage is a sanctifying influence on the children, particularly those with the inability to believe. He goes on and he says, God will divide families. I do not believe God will divide families by taking the parents to be with him and leaving their children who cannot believe to endure the wrath and the tribulation. To be sure, there will be a separation when the Lord returns, but they will be between those who have trusted Christ and those who have not trusted him. It is unlikely that separation will be between saved parents and their children who are unable to believe. So what is the sort of consensus or school of thought in our camp on this issue. If the parent or the mother is saved and pregnant, then the unborn child is taken in the rapture. If the parent or perhaps a parent is saved and the child is beneath the age of accountability, when the rapture occurs, that parent will be taken and so will the child. But then Robert Leitner goes on and he gives the other side of this. What of pregnant women who are not saved? He says they will not be changed, but will remain on the earth to endure the time of the great tribulation. And what about their unborn infants? We know that there will be great suffering on the earth as it experiences a time of unparalleled tribulation. Jesus specifically mentioned mothers when he spoke of it in Matthew 24, verse 19. Expectant mothers, he spoke of it in Matthew 24, verse 19, living on the earth during the tribulation. Regardless of the mother's choices not to accept Christ, notice what he says here. All children born during the tribulation period are protected by grace. There are no, they are no different than other children who are not able to believe. And unfortunately, in this particular book, he didn't really unpack exactly what he means by that. And, you know, he's dead now, so I can't ask him. But apparently his view is if a mother is an unbeliever at the time of the rapture, she is left behind. The child within her is left behind. But when that child is born in the events of the tribulation, if they are under the age of accountability, then they are protected by God's grace. Maybe he means by that they are protected from the tribulation judgment somehow. Maybe what he means by that is if the child were to die, that child would go into the presence of the Lord. Which raises one other question. What about the children of unbelievers? What we've talked about here is the children of believers. What about the children of unbelievers at the point of the rapture? What about children beneath the age of accountability at the point of the rapture? And here's my answer. I really don't know. I'm sort of confident that children of believing parents are covered. But our camp really doesn't seem very aggressive in saying all children are covered. So that, I'm not saying they're not covered. I'm not saying they are or they are not. I'm saying that's a question I really don't have an answer to. 
So what do you do with questions like that? Do you get embittered at God? Frustrated because God hasn't answered the question the way I want it? Or do you accept the fact that this book is a book of finite revelation? It's not the United States tax code. It's not designed to carve out and talk about every single contingency that may come up. Do you accept the idea that this is a limited revelation and yet it's a sufficient revelation? That's where I am. I don't have an answer to this question. I just know that what God has given me in this book is enough. So then what do you do with all of these children beneath the age of accountability who happen to be born in the home of unbelievers? What do you do with that when the rapture occurs? My answer is I don't know. And I wouldn't posit to know something that God's word hasn't really spoken on. Well, doesn't that keep you up at night tossing and turning? No. Uh, I sleep like a baby, quite frankly. Because at the end of the day, I trust God's character. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this, as clearly as it can be said. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing any to perish, but to all, for all to come to repentance. That's who God is. Um, In fact, twice in Ezekiel 18, once in Ezekiel 18, verse 23, and then at the very end of the chapter in Ezekiel 18, verse 32, God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Rather, what pleases me is that the wicked man would turn from his wicked ways and live. Now, when an enemy of Christianity, like a famous atheist, dies, you would not believe the stuff that Christians put on their social media pages. It's stunning. It's, it's almost like they're gleeful the person died. And when I see that kind of mindset developing on social media, I usually just post Ezekiel 18, verse 23. I don't comment on it. I just quote the verse where it says, God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Because I want the Christian world, whoever happens to come across my account, I want the Christian world to understand that, yeah, the Christian world might be gleeful over the death of a villain or an antagonist to Christianity. But God is not. God is not gleeful. God is not gleeful about any soul that perishes and goes into a a Christless eternity. God was not gleeful over any of the worst human rights violators on planet Earth when they died either. God did not approve of what they did, but their death was a sadness to him, is a sadness to him, because that's a soul that God created for whom Christ died. And my Bible says that at the end of the day, God doesn't want anyone to perish. And I may not have the exact answer on what happens to those under the age of accountability when they are born into the home of unbelieving parents. But I know at the end of the day, God can be trusted God is good, and he doesn't want anyone to perish. How, when, where, why he he makes the provision for them, um, at the end of the day, I've just got to trust God's character. And that's how you can sleep at night. You're not going to get any sleep at night thinking, oh, if they're the elect, they're going to heaven. If they're the unelect, they went into damnation. And God is glorified in torturing them throughout all eternity in damnation. This, this Calvinism thing, this resurgence of hyper-Calvinism, it's one of the most frightening developments I've ever seen in my lifetime in Christianity. Because what it ultimately is, it's an assault. It's an attack on God's very character. In fact, Dave Hunt, who wrote a critique... Uh, He was one of the first, really, to come out with a full 
book-length critique of Calvinism, the title of his book is, What Love Is This? I mean, you know, you, you guys, the way you talk, you sound like that's the God of Islam that deceives and torments and is gleeful. Uh, that's not the God of the Bible because God is love. Let me show you this same thought elsewhere. Go to 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. I want you to know where these verses are because the day is going to come in your life where you're not going to have the answers to everything. And you're going to go to God's word and you're going to be looking for things that you want answered and God, God doesn't have an answer for you. And if you don't understand the character of God, you're just going to have one sleepless night after another. And you have to understand what God's word says about God. This concept, 2 Peter 3 verse 9, is repeated in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, where it says, Of God our Savior, verse 3, into verse 4, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God is not in the business of picking petals from the flower. You know, this one's saved, this one's not. This one's destined for an eternity in the, unto heaven, this one's destined for damnation, which is the horrific, horrific doctrine of double predestination, which the new Calvinists and the hyper-Calvinists talk about all of the time. That some people are actually created for the purpose of experiencing the wrath of God for all eternity. And as the, the torment of their voice rises, and as the smoke rises up to God, somehow God smells that and is pleased with it. If that's what you believe God is like, I would recommend you leave Christianity, I recommend Islam to you. But that's not Bible. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 says, God desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. But the truth of the matter is God is a gentleman. Uh, he's made us in his image. Which means we have the power of volition. If I want to reject God, God says, okay, I'll respect your decision. But God is not in the business of sending people into an eternal torment before he's given them some kind of ability to choose. So that means well, what happens to the mentally retarded, what happens to unborn children, um, what happens to those beneath the age of accountability, even if they're in the homes of unbelievers, what happens to them? I don't know if I know. Because the Bible doesn't tell me. But the Bible does tell me that, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Bible does tell me 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. And so at some point, I'm going to have to rest and trust in the character of God. It's, it's kind of like you're in a car with somebody and you're driving and you're in some part of the country or part of the city that you're unfamiliar with and you're dependent upon the person you're driving with to give you the right directions to get you to the destination that you're to arrive at so what do you do when you're in that circumstance do you sit there and demand where are we going to go now what do we do now give me the road map now I, I got to see what's happening now or do you say, you know what, the person I'm with, I trust their knowledge. I trust their character. So when they're giving directions, I don't have to have a map in front of me. They know what they're doing. They're not going to mislead me. Their character is such that they wouldn't mislead me. Their knowledge is such that they don't have the ability to mislead me. So even though I don't have the exact, exact road map, I can just sort of trust in what they're saying. That's how your walk with God is. Because there will be, if not this issue, others. There will be conundrums that come into your life that you just can't figure out. And God in those instances is basically saying... Trust my character. 
I've got this figured out. I've got this. So that is my best attempt at this question that many, many people have asked. Infants and the rapture. Um, Let's go ahead and do a second question, shall we? This is a little bit more kinder and gentler. Is the church in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9? No. Okay, next question. No, I won't do that. (laughs) Take a look at Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. A lot of people think this is the church here. In fact, let me read to you the question. It says, in Revelation 7, verse 9, it says, After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Close quote. My question is, what do we, do we tell people who say these are Christians who go through the tribulation. Well, in a certain sense, they are Christians in the tribulation. I mean, these are believers in the tribulation. But it doesn't mean that they are church-age believers. It's interesting, as you study the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation has an outline to it. The outline has three parts. This is very typical of what you see in the Bible. Sometimes you'll get into a book and the book will give you an outline at the very beginning. It's like reading the book of Acts. You're reading Acts chapter 1 and you get to chapter 1 verse 8 and Jesus says to the disciples, you will be my my witnesses both in Jerusalem Judea and Samaria, and to the other parts of the earth. Hey, look at that. That's an outline to the book of Acts. Isn't that cool? You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's Acts 1 through 7. You'll be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. You know, these are basically like areas... uh, Outlining, if you will, the city of Jerusalem. It's, it's a difference, we would say, between a, a city and a, and a county that that city is in. So you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Acts 1 through 7, in Judea and Samaria, Acts 8 through 12, and to the remote parts of the earth. That's Acts 13 through 28, where Paul went on three missionary journeys outside of the borders of Israel, and he took his fourth journey, as I like to call it, in chains because he kept demanding a trial before Caesar, which means he had to get shipped to Rome. And Paul wanted to get to Rome because once he got gospel truth to Rome, he knew that the gospel would go everywhere because all roads lead to Rome. So Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is an outline of the book of Acts. Revelation chapter 1 verse 19 is an outline of the book of Revelation. Therefore, write the things that you have seen, that's part one. Write down the things that are, that's part two. Write down the things that will take place after these things, that's part three. Write down the things that you have seen, that's chapter one. That's the vision of the glorified Christ that John saw at the end of the first century on the island of Patmos. And he gives us a description there of Jesus in his glorified state. Then John is told to write down the things that are. That's the letters to the seven churches. Revelation 2 and 3. Seven contemporaneous churches that were in existence when John wrote. And then John is told to write down the things that will take place after these things. The Greek is metatauta. And when does that section start? Look at Revelation 4 verse 1. What does it say there? After these things. Hey, that's metatauta. Just like in Revelation 1 verse 19. Look at the end of Revelation 4, verse 1. Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after these things. Hey, that's metatauta. 
twice in that verse. So when it says, after these things, metatauta, it's signaling that we're now in part three of the book, which is the future futuristic prophecy about the end of the age. It's the part of the book of Revelation that most people are aware of, and yet that's only part three. By the time we get to chapter four, we've had parts one and part two. Now here's what is very, very interesting is the word church, which is the word ecclesia. In part one and part two, chapters one through three total, the word church is used, ecclesia, 19 times. That's a lot of usages. Then you get to that metatauta, chapter four, verse one, and you go all the way through chapter 22, and how many uses of the word church are there in that large section? Zero. Except a little dinky thing at the end, where John is told to preach these things in the churches. Revelation 22, verse 16. Other than that, no reference to ecclesia in that section. So the question is, why is it used 19 times in chapters 1 through 3, and other than that brief reference at the end, not a single time in the futuristic section of the book? The answer is very simple from our perspective. The church is not on the earth at the time because the church is in heaven. Well, how in the world did she get into heaven? The rapture occurred before that futuristic section started. In fact, if you want to find the church in that section, you don't find it on the earth. You find references to the 24 elders, the seven lampstands, which are the churches. It's in heaven. It's certainly not on the earth. And in fact, the word is not even used in that section. So with all of that being said, that's how you understand Revelation 7. Revelation 7 could not be talking about the church because of what I just tried to explain. The church on the earth is missing in that final section. What you do discover on the earth during that time period is a lot of Jewish stuff. The ministry of the 144,000 Jews coming from the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, that's pretty interesting. Why is God not using the church there to evangelize the world? Revelation 7. The church is in heaven. That's why he's not using the church. His hand is back on Israel. Because God has unfinished business with the nation of Israel. Revelation 11 talks about the ministry of the two Jewish witnesses. And as you look at the life of the two Jewish witnesses, they sound an awful lot like Moses and Elijah. Revelation 12 talks about Satan losing access to heaven. We all understand that Satan can still go into heaven, right? Not to worship and serve as he once did as a high-ranking angel, but rather to communicate and accuse. If you don't believe Satan still has access to heaven, you can talk to Job about it sometime. I'm sure when you die and get to heaven, Job will tell you all about it. In fact, um, Jesus said to Peter one day in Luke 22... Simon, Simon, Satan has requested permission to sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you. And if the Lord ever said that to me, I'm like, oh, I'm glad you prayed for me. Goodness gracious. I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. So there was a conversation between Satan and God in heaven concerning Job, concerning Simon Peter. When Satan loses access to heaven, which according to Revelation 12 occurs right at the midpoint of the tribulation, he will plummet to the earth knowing he has but a short time. Well, how long is a short time? 
it's 1,260 days. You say, well, pastor, what's the meaning of 1,260 days? What it means is 1,260 days, which is 42 months, three and a half years. The Jews sometimes called this time period a time, times, and a half a time. Time, single Jewish year, times, double Jewish year, half a time, half a Jewish year, one plus two plus one half equals how much? Three and a half. Satan has got exactly three and a half years left to destroy the woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars. Now, who's the woman clothed with the sun and the moon and the 12 stars? It's Israel. Because Joseph himself had a dream about the sun and the moon and the 11 stars, Joseph being the 12th star, Genesis 37, verses 9 and 10, where he narrates this dream to Jacob, and Jacob rebukes him and says, Shall I and your mother and your brothers bow down to you? Who's the sun, the patriarch of Israel? Who's the moon, the matriarch of Israel? Who are the 12 stars, the 12 tribes of Israel? When Satan is removed from heaven in the, at, the, at the midpoint of the tribulation period, you can read it all in Revelation 12, verses 6 through 17. It's all there. He launches an attack not against the church, but against this woman called Israel. Well, why is he not attacking the church? Is Satan attacking the church today? Yes, he is. Is Satan attacking the individual Christian today? Yes, he is. That's why we're told to put on the full armor of God, because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this dark world. So in the second half of the tribulation period, why is Satan not waging war against the church, which he's done for the last 2,000 years? Answer, the church isn't on the earth. You follow? The church is in heaven. So when you get to that futuristic section of the book, what you quickly discover is it has nothing to do with the church other than the church being in heaven praising the Lamb. It has to do with a warfare that Satan is waging against Israel and God again using Israel because God has unfinished business with Israel. So therefore, how could the church, based on everything I said, be in Revelation 7? I mean, there's this great throng of people from every nation. They're not the church. Let me give you a reason beyond what I've said why the great throng of witnesses in Revelation 7 verse 9 are not the church. As you look at Revelation chapter 7, how many groups do you see there? I see two. 144,000 Jewish evangelists. That's group one. Revelation 7, verses 1 through 8. And I also see group two. Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. Also believers from every nation. You'll notice in Revelation 7, there is not one group there. There is two. There is the Jewish nation earlier in the chapter, and then there's this Gentile population, all in faith. And I'm here to tell you, beloved, that that can't be the church. Not only is the word church not present, but the church, by, very de by its very definition, is not divided into groups like that. Isn't that what Paul tells us in the book of Galatians? There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. I'm not seeing one here. I'm seeing two. So people that think this is the church really don't understand fundamental or foundational ecclesiology, which is the doctrine of the church. The church consists of everybody 
who was trusted by faith in the Messiah that the nation rejected. And if you trust in that Messiah for personal salvation, then the Holy Spirit takes you and identifies you with this new man called the body of Christ. If you're a woman that gets saved, you're baptized or identified into that. If you're a man that gets saved, you're baptized or identified into that. At the point of faith. If you're free, you're baptized and identified into that. If you're a slave, you're baptized and identified into that. If you're Gentile, you're baptized and identified into that. If you're Jewish, you're baptized and identified into that. That's the definition of the church. If you're a Republican, you're baptized and identified into that. If you're, uh, I can't even bring myself to say it. (laughs) If you're the other party, and you can be a member of the other party, just don't tell anybody, we're good with that. If you're a member of the other party, you're baptized and identified into that. That's how the body of Christ works. If you've lived a clean life and never had any problems, you're baptized and identified into that. If you've lived a dirty life, you're baptized and identified into that. Because in the body of Christ, there is no division. You follow? Right here in Revelation 7 is a division. So if there's a division here on national grounds, this can't be the church. It's completely foreign to what Paul explains concerning the church. Well, then who are all these people, this great multitude? They are those reached by the 144,000 after the church is removed. That's who they are. Very early on in the tribulation, these 144,000 are brought to faith. And they don't have to spend years and years and years in seminary to learn Hebrew because they're already Jewish. And God puts his hand on them. They're called the first fruits. And he uses them to reach the rest of the nation and the rest of the world. So that's who this great throng of witnesses is. It has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with the people that are left behind following the rapture that are evangelized by the 144,000. You mean world missions doesn't rest completely on our shoulders? I mean, what's poor God going to do with the church not here? What's he going to do with all of our missionary societies? And all of our efforts to reach the world for Christ. The, the fact of the matter is, people, God uses us today not because he needs us. Do we understand that? He wants to use us. And the day in history will come where we'll be in heaven and God doesn't say, Oh no, I don't have the First Baptist Church of Houston anymore. What am I going to do? What am I going to do without the Presbyterian Church? What am I going to do without the Methodist Church? God says, I've got this. Everything's under control. You members of the church, praise the Lamb in heaven, and I'm going to reach the world through the 144,000 Jews, which, by the way, shouldn't surprise us. Because isn't that what God said at the beginning in the book of Genesis that we're studying in the main service? What did God say to Abram? In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And to be honest with you, Israel, to a very large extent, has fumbled the football. But here's the thing about Israel. She's the gift that keeps on giving. Just because she's fumbled the football in the past doesn't mean she's not going to get it right at some point. There, there is language in your Bible of work that God wants to do and will do in and through Israel that has never been exhausted. So the church is taken to heaven and God is now reaching the world through the Jewish nation, which is not a shock and it's not a surprise because God at the beginning of his book said, I'll bless the world through the Jewish nation. 
And so I didn't do too much teaching here. I did more preaching, didn't I? So maybe in the next hour I'll do more teaching. Or maybe we'll do teaching and preaching. Or maybe we'll just leave and go to lunch early. I don't know. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for your truth, your word. Help us to handle your word eschatologically properly in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, and happy intermission.